Welcome everyone to session five of Biostatistics for Biomedical Research. I'm glad you're with us. Um, today we cover one sample problems, first for a continuous uh, response variable and then for a binary response variable. So we're going to be estimating means and uh, proportions and doing inferences for them. And this is our first time that we'll have some uh, Bayesian how-to some very practical uh, uh, demonstrations of how to do Bayesian analysis as well as traditional frequentist analysis. This session is being uh, broadcast a bit differently from the others in that it's being premiered on YouTube uh, as a pre-recorded video, but I will be uh, watching the video with you and interacting with you on the chat box. Uh, and so um, you may want to uh, configure your chat box on YouTube to see the uh, most recent um, uh, chat messages first to, by setting the chat to live. So um, let's get started with our material. We start with one sample tests and uncertainty intervals for the mean of a continuous random variable. So we start with a traditional approach in the frequentist world. Um, and so we're assuming uh, for classical uh, parametric inference, we're assuming a continuous response uh, where the data come from a normal distribution. And the test that's involved with a one sample test for a mean, an unknown population mean, mu, is to test uh, mu against some constant. So we might have a null hypothesis that mu is equal to that constant. Uh, that particular sort of test is actually sort of unusual, uh, except when you have paired data, uh, such as pre and post measurements, um, and you might want to test against a difference of zero. We'll talk about paired data at the end of this session. Now, the t-test is the most common uh, test for a mean, and the general form of a t-test is that you have um, a numerator, which is the um, estimate that you make, such as our mean, minus the hypothesized value, uh, which may be zero, it could be anything, and then we divide by the standard uh, deviation of the numerator. So that is the t-ratio. Uh, the standard deviation of a summary statistic is called the standard error, which is the square root of the variance of the estimate. That's in the denominator here. And so the one simple uh, sample t-test for testing a single population mean against a constant, such as mu zero, uh, is uh, the mean minus the hypothesized value divided by the standard error. And the standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of the raw measurements, little s, divided by the square root of n. So the raw person-to-person uh, -person variability uh, divided by the square root of the sample size used to estimate the mean. So this is called the standard error of the mean. Uh, now when your data comes from a normal distribution uh, and the null hypothesis is true, the T ratio statistic follows the T distribution. So it's a bit confusing because I'm using the symbol T to mean both uh, the statistic and the distribution, but as we'll see shortly, when we're talking about the distribution, we usually have subscripts on the uh, lowercase t. Now, the reason we're using a T distribution instead of a normal distribution for this ratio is that we're estimating the standard deviation um, and uh, we don't know it as a constant. And if you're estimating the standard deviation and your sample size were very large uh, and your, your data were normally distributed, uh, you could almost pretend that the standard deviation was known. But in the case where n is small, the standard deviation estimate can be quite uh, uh, imprecise and the t-ratio recognize this, recognizes this by putting it against a t-distribution, which can have a heavy tails uh, for small n. Uh, 
as n goes up without bound, the t distribution becomes the normal distribution with a mean zero and a standard deviation of one. Now the parameter that defines the particular t distribution that we're using is the uh, degrees of freedom and uh, the degrees of freedom is equal to the sample size minus the number of means being estimated. Now we're in the one sample problem, that means we're estimating exactly one mean. Um, it could be the mean of the difference between pre and post, but that's still one mean. So the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. And the t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom is denoted as t sub n minus 1. And the R code is here just shows um, a graph of the probability density functions for t-distributions with varying degrees of freedom. And that's against the normal distribution, which is the dashed curve, which comes out at the top here. So the normal distribution is the most peaked uh, distribution here. And you see that as the t-distribution has fewer and fewer degrees of freedom, all the way down to 2 here, uh, with this sort of light uh, blue curve, uh, you see that the it's less peaked and it has much heavier tails. And that's just reflecting the instability of estimating what's in the denominator uh, for the standard deviation. If you knew the population standard deviation, you would use a Z statistic instead of a T statistic, and you'd be talking about the distribution where the dashed line is. Now a two-tailed uh, p-value uh, for a one-sample t-test is a probability of getting a value from the t-distribution that's as big or bigger in absolute value than the observed t-ratio. So the p-value as we've covered in a previous session is a measure of surprise it's a measure of how surprising your data would are if the null hypothesis is really true. Now once you calculate the t-ratio, instead of looking the p-value up in a book as we used to do, uh, there's all sorts of software out there and R provides uh, all the distribution functions you're likely to need. It can use that for calculating the two-tailed p-value. There's a uh, an R expression down here in the footnote that shows exactly how to do that. So it's taking the absolute value of the t-ratio um, and multiplying the, the tail area by 2 because it, we're talking right now about a two-tailed test. By the way, when you're calculating the p-value, you don't want to report it as less than something but equal to something. So if you're um, setting up for a Neyman Pearson type of hypothesis test, which is not done that often nowadays and for good reason, uh, you can calculate the critical value uh, from the t-distribution using this notation that's given here. Uh, and that critical value um, is um, going to converge to 1.96 as n goes to infinity if alpha is 0.05. Um, and um, the larger n is, the closer, the, the better the approximation, the normal distribution is for the t-distribution. But you can calculate the critical value, it might be 2 or something, um, and you can test against that critical value if you were rejecting the null hypothesis at the, at the 0.05 level. Uh, instead of just reporting the p-value, which I think uh, reporting the p-value would be a better idea. That's more the Fisher uh, school of thought. So here's an example where we have um, a null hypothesis that we want to test against a specific unknown population mean tumor volume, uh, whether it's 190 cubic millimeters in a population of patients with melanoma. So the null hypothesis is that mu is equal to 190 uh, against uh, an alternative which is anything other than 190. So if you have an observed mean that is 181.52 and a sample standard deviation of 40 uh, and an n of 100 and your null value that you're testing against is 190, this is how you calculate your t value, t ratio, and in this case it's minus 2.12.
Now the critical value uh, with an n of 100, which means you have 99 degrees of freedom, and the critical value is the t.975 quantile, because we have a tail area uh, of 0.025 on both tails, multiply that by 2, you get 0.05. The critical value is 1.84, and so we could reject at a very arbitrary alpha 0.05 level if we're using the Neyman Pearson paradigm. Otherwise, we could just report a p-value of 0.037. So we have some mild evidence against the null hypothesis that the unknown population mean is equal to 190. So this just shows you some R code for doing this calculation. You normally would use a higher level function to do all this for you, but it's very easy to uh, code that up. So that is the uh, one sample t-test, and you can also um, use the, uh, the t uh, distribution to get a confidence interval for the unknown population mean, and we'll see how to do that shortly. Now we turn to the alternate approach. One alternate approach is Bayesian methods. Um, and um, Bayesian methods are really much different in spirit and in calculation from frequentist methods. And what makes Bayes uh, flow very well is the mathematical simplicity. It's not simple computationally, but mathematically it is. And, and that is simple because all aspects of Bayesian probabilistic inference follows from the general form of Bayes' rule. Uh, that allows for the Y uh, response to be continuous. And so uh, when you have a continuous random variable, instead of talking about a discrete probability distribution, such as the probability of getting three heads out of five tosses and the probability of getting four heads out of five tosses with a binomial distribution, we don't calculate the probability of getting exactly uh, some mean uh, because that for a continuous distribution of y, that probability of getting any certain mean is zero. So instead of a probability uh, function for discrete uh, situations, we talk about probability density functions, which are just the limiting form of a probability of being in a certain uh, interval uh, divided by the width of the interval as the width goes to zero. And so all of Bayesian inference uh, in terms of probabilistic inference uh, is based on uh, Bayes' formula, um, and it says that the probability function for the unknown parameter, such as mu and sigma, given the data and the prior, is proportional to the density function for the data, which for now we're just assuming is a normal distribution, multiplied by the density function for the prior. And so it's just a simple multiplication in the usual sense, and the only thing that makes Bayes complicated is how to make that product have a probability distribution that sums up to one or integrates to one. So you have to know the denominator of Bayes' formula to be able to do that, and that denominator uh, is often uh, fairly hard to calculate, but as we'll mention in a minute, you don't really always need to calculate that. So the Bayesian counterpart to the frequentist t-test approach uh, can use the same model we had before. We have uh, unknown parameters mu and sigma, and we assume the raw data come from a normal distribution. So we're going to assume all of that, but we're going to allow other information to be brought into the problem, uh, and that information is in the form of prior distributions or prior knowledge about the two unknown parameters. Now the raw data have a, an arbitrary scale, unlike the situation when you're estimating a probability or an odds ratio or a hazard ratio. Uh, and so when you have something that can take an arbitrary scale, we frequently use a nearly flat uh, prior, what's called a weakly informative prior. For these parameters, you could use a totally flat uninformative prior. But it's very easy to substitute any prior uh, not just a, a weakly informative prior, but you could have also priors that are discontinuous in the sense that uh, 
the prior just uh, changes to zero outside of some range of plausibility. So you might have some uh, known to be impossible values, such as a mean of something being negative or greater than a certain value being impossible, incompatible with life, for example, if you're talking about blood pressure. And you can have a prior that goes to zero outside of the range of plausibility. So there's lots of different ways to specify a prior distribution. Now we have to remember that the, the traditional approach to the one sample mean problem uh, actually is bringing in a very strong additional assumption, uh, 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 which is that the data have a Gaussian distribution. And as we'll see shortly, uh, Bayes makes it really easy to relax the normality assumption, but still do your inference in familiar ways like we're about to do when we're assuming normality and using Bayesian inference. Uh, and so that ability to not assume a certain distribution, um, but to not really make the sample size need to be much bigger is a great strength of Bayes, and I think you'll see that shortly. For now, we're assuming normality holds, and we're gonna use relatively uninformative priors. So I'm going to stop a minute and just talk about software. There's a lot of software options. Uh, probably the number one uh, general purpose Bayesian modeling software system is STAN from Andrew Gelman's group at uh, Columbia University. And STAN really has state-of-the-art computer science going into it as well as state-of-the-art statistical methods. And it's under active development by a large team, really a strong scientific team at Columbia, uh, and others are contributing to it. And then um, there's some uh, front-end packages to stand in various languages, including uh, Python. But in R, there's some front-ends to stand. There's one called R Stand ARM, which is very highly recommended. And then there is BRMS. Uh, which is what we're going to be using in this course, uh, I think, mo most all the time when we do Bayesian analysis. Uh, that's by uh, Paul Christian Berkner. Uh, and so it uses the same notation as the other R modeling functions in the frequentist world. Uh, and it has some nice defaults for priors. And that makes it very appealing. And so it's very easy to do general linear models with BRMS. So we're going to go with that notation so we really have some uniformity. I think it makes it easier to learn. Uh, so we're going to start out with a one sample problem where the regression model notation looks a little bit of an overkill. But I think you'll see the appeal of that very soon. Uh, now, most Bayesian calculations involve calculating a posterior distribution that cannot be uh, derived analytically. So it may involve some integrations that are just too hard to do. But with um, Markov chain Monte Carlo type methods, you can sample from the posterior distribution without normalizing it. So if you have the numerator of the posterior distribution, uh, so you have something proportional to the posterior, but you don't know what the denominator is, you can still use various sampling algorithms. And um, that, that makes everything much, much simpler and allows you to deal with many, many types of models without worrying about complex uh, calculus, complex integration. Now for the uh, examples that we'll be seeing here, uh, we're drawing 4,000 samples from the posterior distribution, which is enough for our purposes. And there's some comments here to help you gauge uh, how many uh, posterior draws you might want to do uh, to have a certain margin of error in estimating posterior probabilities. So if you drew up to 40,000 posterior draws, you could pretty much nail down a posterior probability calculation over the whole range of uh, parameters to within a margin of error of plus or minus 0 0.005. So let's try to make this more concrete with an actual example. And so we're going to um, have our one sample continuous measurement problem. And our raw data are listed here. And you can see that uh, the values are hovering here around 100. And then you have this one outlier. Uh, 
at 132. So we have a, kind of an unexpected value. Uh, you might say there's a heavy right tail to the distribution and you might question normality of the data. Whereas if you just looked at these values over here to the left of 132, there would be nothing to really make you question normality. So we're going to start with the ordinary frequentist analysis, which you'll see is not going to be very robust to, the, to that outlier. Uh, now we're most interested in a confidence interval uh, in this situation, not so much in hypothesis testing, but let's suppose we really um, test a null hypothesis that the unknown population mean is 110. So we create a vector with our data in R and we calculate various uh, summary measures. Uh, so we have the median of the sample is 102.5. The standard deviation is 11.3. And then we have several other dispersion or variability measures. So the first one is a fairly robust measure. What is the mean absolute uh, departure from the mean? So the mean of the absolute values of the difference in the raw data and, and the mean, and that is going to be not so influenced uh, because we're not squaring any deviations like you do in the standard deviation. You're just taking absolute value so the 132 value is not going to have a whole lot of in, uh, influence. Um, and so that, that mean absolute difference is 6.9. The mean absolute difference from the median is going to be more robust, 6.25. And then one of my favorite measures of dispersion is Gini's mean difference, uh, which is the mean of all possible absolute differences between two different observations. And in this case, it's a little bit lower than standard deviation is 10.8. And then there's a very robust measure that's statistically not very efficient, which is the median of the absolute differences from the median. And that is going to be really tilted towards what you see as the variation here uh, that is typical. Uh, and that, that number is uh, equal to 3.5. Now, if we ignore the potential for the data to really not be coming from a normal distribution, uh, we can do the t-test and test the null hypothesis mu is equal to 110. And this is a built-in function in R. So we see the t-ratio is minus 1.19 with 7 degrees of freedom because it's 8 observations. The p-value, which is two-sided, is 0.27, making a pretty strong assumption of normality. Um, and you have the 95% confidence intervals uh, for the unknown interval for the unknown population mean of 95.8 to 114.7. And then our sample mean is 105.25. Uh, so what is a Bayesian counterpart to that? Well, this is really a regression problem. Uh, we'll we'll Use it, use it as a regression problem, so this will easily extend to the more complex situations. Um, and it's a regression problem where the linear model has only an intercept in it. Uh, now we need to have, and, and for that setup, our, our notation is you have an intercept only model, which has tilde one uh, on the right hand side of the model formula. There's no covariate there, it's just a constant and that stands for intercept only model. Now we need prior distributions for mu and sigma. Uh, we're going to use a default uh, distribution uh, from BRMS, which is kind of a scaled uh, T distribution with low degrees of freedom. Um, and the prior distribution for the mean that we're going to use is that uh, before we saw the data, we thought that the most likely value of the true unknown mean was 150 and the standard deviation of the prior distribution is 50. So if you took 150 plus or minus 2 times 50, uh, you would say that the mean is likely, most likely to be between 50 and 250. So that's how we're stating our prior distribution for the mean and this is a weekly informative prior. And so we're going to get access to the BRMS package. We're going to put our data in the data frame and we're going to call a function in BRMS, which is prior, which is specifying our prior for the intercept. And the intercept is just the mean, 
the population mean or in base since you don't really need a population it's whatever generated our data set um, so the prior for mu is normal with a mean of 150 and a standard deviation of 50 and then our model is uh, the fit object is going to be stored as f and the model is uh, y tilde 1 meaning the the um, response variable is modeled as just a single parameter which is the intercept or mean the family for the raw data is the normal family or Gaussian so we're assuming normal distribution for y the prior for mu and we didn't list up here priors for anything else so those will be default priors the prior for mu is called prior mu and we're just going to set a random number seed so we could run the same thing again and get the same answer with all the simulation that's going on now there's a nice function in BRS, BRMS to, to replay for you uh, what priors are being assumed for all the parameters. So we say prior underscore summary and we see that the prior for the intercept is this and we have uh, a, a student T distribution. Uh, it, there's a little more to it than what this is telling you here for the standard deviation. It's allowing pretty, for a pretty wide uh, span of possible standard deviation, but it is inside of what's going on is forcing the standard deviation to be positive. So if we look at the result um, of our uh, Bayesian analysis, we see it's a Gaussian family, um, and uh, we're not transforming mu because it's identity function. We're not transforming uh, sigma either. And then we see some of the results of our Monte Carlo simulations and some diagnostics. So this R hat is a one of the nicer diagnostics. Uh, they're telling you if your if your uh, process has converged in your sampling and whether you have an effective number of samples that what it seems to be. So with an R hat of one, uh, that can be read as the 4,000 samples. Uh, really is effectively co close to 4,000. Now we see for the intercept this, this estimate, and so that estimate is the, uh, the posterior mean, so it's just the mean of the 4,000 samples we took from the posterior distribution for mu, and we have an estimated uh, standard error for that. And then we have credible intervals, so these are not confidence intervals, but these are Bayesian uh, 0.95 credible interval of 96 to 114. Uh, then we have uh, a specific parameter for the normal distribution which is sigma. Our posterior mean uh, for sigma was 12 and um, we have a credible interval for the standard deviation. So this is something we're not used to thinking of whenever you estimate a standard deviation there is imprecision in that especially for smaller sample sizes like we have and so um, the the probability is 0.95 that the unknown sigma is between 7.4 and 20. the mean of the distribution of sigma is 12.18 so let's just go back to see what we had uh, what we had before for the uh, standard deviation, the sample standard deviation was 11.28. So the Bayesian posterior mean uh, it turns out to be just a little bit bigger than that. Uh, but now you can do some nice things because these draws give you a large sample to calculate anything you want to from that. And so we can just uh, take the fit object and if we use the as.dataframe function in R that has a specific meaning and that means to create a data frame with all the posterior draws for all the parameters. So that data frame will have these two columns in it, mu and sigma, and you see mu is 4,000 long because of 4,000 posterior draws. Um, now the credible intervals are quantiles of the posterior samples and you can duplicate the credible interval that was computed automatically by BR, the BRM function of BRMS. Um, all you have to do is to take the 0.025 and 0.975 quantiles of these 4,000 samples, 
and that comes out to be exactly the values that we had before in the uh, output just previously. Now you can also compare uh, the credible interval here with the 0.95 frequentist confidence interval which is not too far away from this. Now to compare the posterior means for mu and sigma uh, with the point estimates uh, from the traditional analysis is not necessarily the way that we want to do a comparison because the posterior mode is more like what the traditional analysis is doing. So the posterior mode is the most likely value of the distribution, uh, so where the peak of the density function is in the posterior. Uh, now the sample mean is the maximum likelihood estimator in, in fre the frequentist world, and um, a maximum likelihood estimator is the same as a posterior mode from Bayes if the prior was flat. And so we're going to use the posterior mode even though our prior is not flat and we're going to do that for the uh, mu and for sigma. Now to estimate the posterior mode we're just going to fit empirically a non-parametric density function estimator to the 4000 posterior draws and solve for where the peak of that density function is. And this little function PMO does, does exactly that. So if we look at our original mean of 105.25 and our original standard deviation 11.28, this is the maximum likelihood estimator of the population standard deviation because the maximum likelihood estimator doesn't divide by n minus 1, it divides by n. Now compare those with the Bayesian posterior modes, 105.6 and 10.56. So you can see those are very close. Now when you get into uh, uh, drawing inference about an unknown uh, parameter that generated your data, uh, it's much more intuitive and actually very easy to do this with Bayes. So we're not going to do a hypothesis test, but we're going to say quantify the evidence uh, for the unknown mean being greater than 110 given the data and given our prior distributions. And so we can, we can approximate that to any arbitrary degree of accuracy by having more and more posterior draws and just counting how many of the posterior draws are greater than 110. So we can make that even more intuitive by defining a probability operator in R, and that probability operator is just the mean function. So P is going to be just uh, running the mean function. So if you take the mean of things that are zeros and ones, or things that are true and false, um, the mean of those kind of variables is just the proportion of trues. And so this just says, give me the sum of how many posterior draws are greater than 110 divided by the number of posterior draws, which is 4,000. And that is estimating the probability uh, to within our simu small simulation error with our sample size of 4,000. It's estimating the, the mean, the probability that the mean is greater than 110, and that, uh, that number is 0.143. Now under a flat prior distribution uh, there is somewhat of a correspondence between this number and a one-tailed p-value although the interpretation is is completely different so you can sort of compare this 1.136 which is half of the p-value that we had before we can compare that um, with uh, the 0.143, which is the posterior probability of being greater than 110. Uh, now the plot method gives us a lot of information uh, when you run a BRMS. So now we see our estimated posterior distribution for the intercept. We see some diagnostics in how the samples unfolded. Um, and the samples were sampled from four independent chains that totals up to 4,000 uh, samples, and we're really looking for kind of white noise here uh, to see if our chain converged to give us the right random draws from the posterior distribution.
now you have something that's really new to you, uh, I think, which is the uncertainty in estimating sigma. So this is our posterior distribution for uh, sigma. And you see that's a very skewed distribution. So that is the plot output from the BRM function. Um, now we need to go back to the issue that we've made a strong assumption about normality. Um, heavy tails can hurt the validity of an estimate of the mean. It can hurt uncertainty intervals and p-values. And uh, we need to find uh, an example that I've seen that really demonstrates, demonstrates this. If you have um, a bunch of points on a line and you do a t-test uh, for comparing two groups, so you're really comparing one clump of points against another clump of points on the same line, uh, and you, get, you can get a significant t-test for the difference in those two means, but you add a point to the right of the group that's already on the right. You add a point way out in the right tail, and that point destroys the standard deviation. And even though it makes the mean more different, it makes the t-statistic become insignificant. So that's what this is really referring to. And there's especially problems with stability of the standard deviation. And indeed, what does the standard, standard deviation mean when you have an asymmetric distribution? So we can handle the heavy tails part uh, by relaxing the normality assumption and by adding a single new parameter to the model. And the parameter is actually going to be called new, no pun intended. So we're going to assume that the raw data, even though we use a t-distribution for statistics, we're going to use it now for raw data. We're going to assume the raw data come from a t-distribution with unknown degrees of freedom, new. Um, so you don't want to confuse our two different usage of t here. And so John Kruschke has written much about this, and he has papers and R, an R package called BEST, which means Bayesian estimation supersedes the t-test, and really points out that Bayesian t-tests have many advantages over classical t-tests. This will get to be more apparent even when we get into the two-sample t-test in the next session. Now the degrees of freedom for the t-distribution we're using for our raw data, when that exceeds 20, we know that the t-distribution, we saw those density curves in our plot, the t-distribution is getting closer and closer to the normal distribution. So you could say when the degrees of freedom are greater than 20, you have an almost normal distribution. So we're going to have a prior distribution for, for uh, nu that is a gamma distribution with these parameters, alpha of 2 and beta of 0.1, and we're cons constraining the degrees of freedom to be greater than 1. Um, and so um, what that translates to is our prior probability that the data come from a normal distribution approximately. In other words, the prior probability that, that nu is greater than 20, uh, which you can compute with this gamma probability function, uh, that probability is exactly 0.41. So our prior probability of the data being the data coming from a truly normal distribution uh, is a is a little less than half. So we're a little skeptical against normality, but we're definitely not ruling it out. Um, so now we used BRM with the same exact model we had before, uh, but the family now, meaning the distributional family for the raw data in our model, instead of being Gaussian, is a student t distribution. And we have a prior for our mean, which is the same prior we used before. And the, the prior that is chosen uh, now, it, we have a new prior in our list, which is a prior for new, which has this gamma distribution we talked about. We have the same prior for sigma as before, and the same prior for mu as we had before. So what happens when we, um, when we fit this? We, well, we're going to get our um, output. This is a fit object called G, and you see the information about our model. Um, and we have eight observations, and now we have um, a posterior mean for mu 
which uh, is 103.7 and a 0.95 credible interval of 97 to 113. Then we have an interval uh, for sigma and we have an interval for nu. So uh, the probability is 0.95 that the unknown value of the degrees of freedom for our raw data distribution, T, uh, that interval goes from 1.56 to uh, 50. Uh, so it includes very heavy-tailed distribution, in other words, very non-normal. Now when we get evidence for uh, whether the unknown mu is greater than 110, that's this probability here, which is the proportion of the posterior draws of mu that's greater than 110. Now that's a little more impressive than what we had before. This analysis is not made conservative by having that bigger standard deviation from that heavy tail. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, various quantities and um, then we see our posterior distribution for the unknown mu is wider. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's not as peaked as what we had before, and it's a little bit asymmetric. And we have also, uh, I think that maybe is a little wider than the distribution we had for sigma before. And now we have a posterior distribution for how non-normal the raw data really are. And you can see all these values beyond around 20, uh, that's how much evidence you have for kind of stronger non-normality there. And we also have our diagnostics as before. So the posterior means discount the high outlier a bit, shows a lower chance of a high value for mu. The credible interval for mu is significantly smaller than the confidence interval due to the allowance for heavy tails. Um, so we're, what we're estimating for mu is, is a little bit like trimming some from the tails. The posterior mean, median, and mode of nu are 15, 11, and 4, uh, providing evidence that the data comes from a distribution that's heavier tailed than the normal. The posterior probability that nu is greater than 20 is 0.26. Uh, so the probability that the raw data are coming from an approximately normal distribution is low. Now just contrast that with a frequentist approach where we don't really think of anything like this. We, we, we just either assume or don't assume a normal distribution. And if you, if you really uh, are trying to do more of a non-parametric confidence interval for the mean, that doesn't really exist. So we really need something that allows flexibility and the Bayesian methods will give us exact inference and still be flexible. The traditional standard deviation estimate, the posterior median standard deviation assuming normal y and the posterior median standard deviation assuming a t distribution are 11.29, 10.6, and 7.9. See it's getting smaller. The ordinary standard deviation here is giving too much weight to the high uh, outlier. Now it's really important to note that the analysis we're doing now uh, has the proper penalty for not knowing whether normality holds. If you try to do a test for normality and decide whether to use a t-test, you're assuming that test has a power of 1. You're really making a dichotomous decision about normality or not and you really don't get the right frequentist operating characteristics when you try to make a decision about normality from the data um, and then pretend that your decision is infallible. The Bayesian approach is just totally different. It says we don't know whether the data are normal or, normal or not, but whether it is or not, we don't really care because we can get valid inference in either case. Now, uh, you can decode the effect of the prior uh, in a variety of ways to find out what it's really doing in influencing our result. And um, one way that is commonly done is to see effectively how many observations the prior is adding to your data or how many observations it's subtracting. Um, 
And so when you have a normal model, this is an easy process to go through. Now, if you let mu0 be your prior mean and sigma0 be your prior standard deviation, like we had, I think, 150 and 50 before, and you have your sample mean and your population mean, uh, standard deviation and your sample size for y bar, then the posterior variance of mu is the uh, reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals of those two variances, the prior variance and the and the sample mean variance. And then that's used in uh, a weighted fashion to calculate the posterior mean. So the posterior mean is a weighted combination of the prior mean and the sample mean. And you see the weights are these two variance ratios where sigma squared p is the variance of the uh, posterior uh, distribution for y bar and this is the variance from the prior. So for a given y bar sample size and, and posterior probability from our slightly informative prior that we've been using, what different sample size m would give you the same posterior probability if the prior was flat? So that's a good way to quantify the effect of using our somewhat informative prior. Now a flat prior is easy to deal with because the variance uh, of a flat prior is infinite. So the posterior variance of mu is just sigma squared over n and the posterior mean for mu is just y bar. So if you estimate the probability of being greater than 110 for the weakly informative prior, at a sample size n and you equate that to the probability of exceeding 110 uh, for the um, uh, you equate the one from the informative prior to the one from the non-informative prior at a different m and solve for m they give you the same probabilities um, and so this just goes through some of the calculation and I'm actually uh, got lazy here and I'm just doing it a uh, numeric solution by uh, root finding which is what the uni root function does in uh, in R you see right right in here and this is just the the difference in the quantities you can you can calculate the difference in the in the posterior probabilities or since uh, those pro probabilities have to be the same you could just say that these two ratios have to be the same so this will solve for that. So you can see that if you had a prior variance uh, standard deviation that was 50,000, might as well be infinite. And so uh, having our weekly informative prior um, is uh, with 8 is equivalent to having uh, a non-informative prior if our, if our prior is so non-informative as to have this large standard deviation. So that should be 8 and it is 8. Um, and now we can calculate a variety of other things. So what would be um, uh, using the original prior standard deviation of, of uh, 50, which was the default value of the function that we created up in, up in here. Um, so what is the uh, sample size that would give you the same posterior probability of exceeding 110 um, with a flat prior. Well, that would be a sample size of 7.3. So um, you can see that using our weekly informative prior was like adding 0.7 observations. Uh, what about if you changed uh, to different values of sigma, uh, 5 or 15, will you go 7.8 to 6.6? So here you're about uh, one and a half observations away from what we had before. And you can just keep trying different combinations. And you'll see that once you get above sample size 20 or so, the effect is very low. And so here we're seeing the effect uh, for a sample size of 15, 30, 300, and 3,000 was always, um, it was always sacrificing 0.7 of an observation. So you see the effect of our prior choice is very, very mild. Um, now in a, another situation where you can do the calculations even easier is when the unknown data standard deviation uh, is assumed to be one. 
and the prior mean is zero, and so your posterior mean is just going to be a shrunken version of the sample mean. And let's suppose we're interested in calculating the probability that mu is greater than zero. So we're going to vary the prior variance sigma squared uh, zero. And for each prior variance, we're going to compute the prior probability that mu is greater than one. So this shows how easy it is to do the calculations. And if you go through that, um, and, and there's a comment here that for a, a real situation, you might just run BRM function again with a flat prior and compare it to your posterior calculations with what you had with your, with your informative prior. That would be a very easy, slower but easy approach. But the graph really sums up what we're trying to do here. So you see when the posterior variance is 0.05, that's a very, I mean, prior variance is 0.05, that's a very sharp prior distribution that says the probability prior that mu is larger is almost zero. When your prior variance is, uh, which would be sigma squared zero, is 0.1, that's the same as saying the probability that mu is greater than one before having the data is is still very small, not as small as, as the one up here, but still very small. And so uh, these are um, these are going to be very skeptical priors. And as your variance gets larger, you see your prior your prior is going to get flatter and flatter, and you're allowing for a larger prior probability of having a large unknown population mean. Now, why do we do all this? Well, if if your sample size without adding skepticism, let's say your sample size that you had by using, and you're using a flat prior to calculate your posterior probabilities, is this, how many extra subjects would be needed uh, to give you the same posterior probability uh, with um, an inf uh, a skeptical prior as you had originally without the skeptical prior? And the important take-home message here is for the sort of skepticism most people use, uh, which is going to be like here or below. So what you're typically talking about once you get to above 15 or 20 observations in your data set is bringing skepticism into the problem is like sacrificing three observations. Here, here it's even less. But think about a sample size 40, uh, without skepticism, now use a skeptical prior. Uh, it's the equivalent of dropping three observations. Is That's the price you're paying for skepticism. Uh, now there is um, power, there are power and sample size um, considerations, and uh, frequentist power calculations are usually easier to do than Bayes, and what's going to make the power go up is you have you're allowing for a larger type 1 error uh, or the true the, the mu that you're trying to detect uh, the true mu is farther from uh, your null value the standard deviation goes down or the sample size goes up now the power uh, for a two-tailed test for a single mean is just a function of the unknown mean, uh, the null value, which could be zero, and the unknown standard deviation. So the sample size to achieve a power of 0.9 with an alpha of 0.05 and using a normal approximation is a very simple form. So this is for a one sample mean hypothesis test. Um, you just, uh, you would have to have a good value to plug in for sigma and then the difference the, the difference you would like to be able to detect square that ratio and multiply it by this and you've got your sample size but you would really use a power calculator to get a more exact calculation that takes into account uh, that you're using a t distribution in your test and not a normal z test um, so this just goes through the example it's very easy to work through these calculations to see that, uh, in this case, a sample size of 42 would achieve a 0.9 power, in other words, a type 2 error of beta of 0.1 with a type 1 error of 
uh, when we assume a population standard deviation of one, um, and the um, the difference to detect here is between uh, 2.5 to 3. And this just shows how to go through some of the calculations. But if you use the PWR uh, package in R, uh, you can get the power calculation uh, assuming the normality of the raw data and so on. You can get the exact power calculation and sample size calculation. You see the sample size is just a little bit different from what we had before, but not much. Now we turn to sample size, I mean, sorry, confidence interval calculation, the parametric form uh, using a normal distribution. And we really don't have a non-parametric confidence interval for a mean. Uh, and the bootstrap doesn't work well enough in general to be able to do that. Uh, so this is the form of a 1 minus alpha two-sided confidence interval for an unknown uh, population mean mu is your sample mean plus or minus your t critical value times the standard error. So it's a very simple formula. It gives you a symmetric confidence interval, which would be okay if your data really have a symmetric distribution. So that's, the, that's a very commonly used formula. You have to be careful that you don't misinterpret confidence interval because um, we know that statements um, like this are not correct because in frequentist inference, you don't really get a probability statement about confidence intervals. Confidence intervals are strictly about long run operating characteristics over infinite repetitions of your experiment. And then there's the comment here about the equivalence between hypothesis testing and confidence intervals in a certain sense. Uh, what to me is a better way to calculate sample size is to say we, are not wanted, we don't want to test against a certain de uh, level to detect for our difference, but we want to be able to estimate the unknown mean with a margin of error of plus or minus delta uh, no matter what the unknown mean is. So we don't really need to talk about a null hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis. We just talk about the margin of error. Um, and so the margin of error uh, is half the width of the confidence interval. So how do we solve for a sample size that will give us a confidence interval whose half width, which is our plus or minus margin of error in estimating uh, mu, uh, achieves that level of precision. Uh, so it's easy to do, easy to calculate a margin of error uh, when you have uh, a known uh, sigma, and it's easy to do the sample size calculation that will achieve a margin of error of, of, uh, of delta. Uh, it's very easy by this formula. Um, if n is, is um, actually this is the, f I misstated that, this is a formula that is taken into account the t distribution. So it's, uh, this is really working for all sample sizes. So the sample size needed to achieve a precision of delta um, is this quantity, so you, you take your t-critical value, multiply it by sigma, uh, divide by your, your uh, margin of error, square all that ratio, and that gives you n. So if n is large enough where this goes to 1.96 when alpha is 0.05, this is your formula for the needed sample size to achieve a margin of error. So if you wanted to nail down a population mean to within a plus or minus one millimeter of mercury for systolic blood pressure when the standard deviation is 10 millimeters of mercury, that would require 384 subjects. So there's many advantages for planning a study with regard to precision rather than power. You don't need to select a single effect to detect. Uh, you don't get into this habit of powering a study to detect a miracle and being disappointed when the only thing you got was a clinically important treatment effect, but it wasn't a miracle. So if you power a study to detect a miracle and it's not a miracle, you're left with nothing.
So you can size a study on precision so that you can estimate something uh, accurately no matter what the value of the thing you're estimating. And so you don't really need a null hypothesis at that point. And this allows you to have an interpretation even when you have a large p-value, whereas the p-value by itself doesn't give you any information when the p-value is large, other than you didn't reject a null hypothesis, but it doesn't tell you uh, anything definitive. So we're going to shift gears now and move into our, our second one sample situation, which is where we're estimating a probability. So probability is a much easier thing to talk about than a mean because we don't have this sigma floating around. Um, so one, a probability is estimated with a proportion and a proportion sort of already defines its own standard deviation. So we're going to estimate a population probability such as probability of disease and we're going to estimate that with a sample estimate p hat and so our data for this sort of situation is we have n trials and we have um, s successes so our maximum likelihood estimate of p is p hat is s over n the proportion of trials that were successes that is the maximum likelihood estimator which is the value of p making our observed data most likely to have been observed which is also the Bayesian posterior mode under a flat prior. Uh, now approximate two-sided test of the null hypothesis p equals p0 can be uh, obtained using a z-statistic and this this is going to be more accurate I think the closer the true probability is to a half but the form of the z-statistic is the estimated probability minus the hypothesized probability divided by the square root uh, of the variance of p hat under the null that p is equal to p0. Uh, so this has the same kind of form as a t-test, an estimate minus a hypothesized value divided by the standard deviation of what's in the numerator. So if you tossed a coin 10 times and got 8 heads uh, and you want to test the null hypothesis that the coin is fair in other words, that p is equal to one half, so our null hypothesized value is p0 is a half. Uh, you can get this z statistic and get the two-tailed p-value using uh, this formula here, and that um, that two-tailed p-value is 0.058, and the z statistic is 1.9. Now you can say um, the approximate probability of getting eight or more or two or fewer heads if the coin is fair is 0.058 using the normal approximation, but you can calculate this exactly. So the probability of getting uh, eight or more or two or fewer heads, so you're doing a two-tailed test, what's the probability of getting data more extreme than yours in either direction? You can just sum up these uh, binomial uh, uh, probabilities of getting 0, 1, 2, 8, 9, or 10 successes or heads out of 10 tosses, and that's 0 0.109, whereas we had a p-value that was approximate of 0 0.06, so this 0 0.109 is going to be better. What about confidence intervals? Uh, well, an interesting thing happens for confidence intervals is if, if you use the exact binomial confidence interval, it's actually not as accurate as the Wilson confidence interval. The Wilson confidence interval is based on what's called a score statistic, um, and you use Wilson's method without a continuity correction, and uh, if you had 8 out of 10 heads and you wanted to know confidence interval for the true probability of heads, the Wilson interval, it's 0.49 to 0.94 probability of heads. You see our approximate method actually allows for probability of heads greater than 1, which is a no-no, and the exact method is 0.44 to 0.97. Ironically, the exact method is not as accurate as the Wilson method. So we really prefer using the Wilson method for confidence intervals for unknown probabilities. Um, 
Now the Bayesian approach to this is um, is very elegant because when you're talking about the binomial distribution um, and you're estimating a probability, uh, this is a situation where there's sort of a top choice for the prior distribution and it happens to have very simple math. So the number of events follows a binomial distribution with parameters p and n. p is the probability of success. The beta distribution is a distribution that has a range of 0 to 1, so it's a candidate for uh, something that describes a, an unknown probability. It has two parameters, alpha and beta, and it's conjugate to the binomial distribution, which means that your posterior distribution is simple. It's just another beta distribution. Now, a beta distribution with parameters alpha and beta has a mean of alpha over alpha plus beta, and then it has a standard deviation given here. And using a beta prior with parameters alpha and beta is identical to adding to your raw data alpha successes and beta failures. The posterior distribution for the unknown probability of success p is just another beta distribution with parameters uh, bumped by your data. So we, we have the number of successes plus the prior alpha and the number of failures plus the prior beta. Now what makes a uniform prior is a beta distribution with alpha equals beta equals 1. So that would be our uninformative prior. But one way to choose the alpha and beta uh, for your prior is to set the alpha and beta to, to, to be constrained to give you a specific mean um, and then solve for the parameters that force the probability of the unknown probability being greater than c to be equal to something for given c and a. So we'll go through that exercise. For the 10 coin example, let's set the prior mean uh, of a half. So we're gonna we're gonna say that our um, our unknown probability of heads is sort of centered at a half and the probability that the probability of heads is so extreme, meaning greater than 0.8, is only 0.05. So we're assigning only a 0.05 chance that the coin is so unfair that the probability of heads exceeds 0.8. So if we solve for alpha and beta, this is just done with a brute force search uh, that satisfies that, we find alpha equals beta equals 3.26. Now for our data, we had eight heads out of 10 tosses. So our posterior distribution is beta with these parameters, 11.26 and 5.26. And we can plot our prior distribution and our uh, posterior distribution for, beta, for, for P on the same graph. So our prior distribution has a lot of uncertainty but it favors the coin being fair. It allows for it to be unfair, but not extremely unfair. And then the posterior distribution is going to be uh, moving towards our observed data of 8 out of 10 heads, and it's, but it's going to be pulled back just a little bit by the prior. So this is our posterior distribution for the unknown probability of heads. So. Um, we can get a credible interval, and to get a 0.95 credible interval for the unknown, unknown probability of heads, we just calculate the quantiles of the beta distribution that represents our posterior, and so we want the 0.025 and 0.975 quantiles, and those numbers are 0.44 to 0.87. So unlike confidence intervals, you get an actual probability statement. The probability is 0.95 that the unknown pr probability of heads is between 0.45 and 0.88. And we can also calculate the probability that the probability of heads is greater than a half. Uh, we estimate that probability to be 0.94. And we can also do something that's mentioned at the bottom of the previous page calculate the probability that the chance of heads is within point, plus or minus 0.05 of fairness.
Now that's a very intuitive concept and when you're doing the frequentist analysis I don't think you really take the time to to ask the question what do you mean by fairness? Is it anything different than 0.5? Uh, in this case, we're going to define fairness as being within 0.05 of 0.5. So we're just calculating the area under the posterior distribution between 0.45 and 0.55. It's a very simple calculation that's shown here. So our probability that the coin is within 0.05 of being exactly fair is only 0.1. So that's a pretty low probability that the coin is close to being fair. Now with power and sample size for a binomial situation, uh, the power is going to go up as n goes up or as the probability departs from the null value uh, and also as the null gets uh, different from a half. Uh, as n goes down, uh, the power goes down. Um, and then you can calculate the sample size for a given precision for a proportion using a simple formula here. And uh, this is using the normal approximation. So assuming that the unknown probability of success is between 0.3 and 0.8, it's best to just use the worst case. So the confidence interval is widest when the true probability is a half. That's at maximum uncertainty. So at that value of a half, uh, this is the standard error for p hat, which is our proportion of successes. And we see the required sample size is 0.96 divided by the square of the margin of error that you want to achieve. Uh, so if you want a margin of error of 0.1, which is half the width of a 95% confidence interval, that's not asking for a very tight margin of error and that requires 96 observations. So I generally say to people, if you want to estimate a, a proportion, uh, you really need a sample size of 96 to do a decent job. And that's really not a great margin of error. So um, if you wanted a margin of error plus or minus 0.05, you need four times as many. Uh, with Bayes, you could say, give me n such that the width of the credible interval achieves a specified value, or the half width we might still call our margin of error. So this just goes through that calculation and shows uh, what is the um, uh, what is the uh, precision, which is the half the width of the credible interval, um, and this what's here on the x-axis is uh, labeled as p uh, but it is really n so that's that's mislabeled so what we show is um, when the number of successes is say one quarter in one half in that's when you're at maximum uncertainty or three quarters in you see um, uh, or one eighth in, seven eighth in. One eighth and seven eighth gives the same answer. One fourth and three fourths of in gives you the same answer because it's a symmetric problem. So um, knowing uh, in, you can calculate the sort of worst case precision for a Bayesian credible interval. And so you're doing something very much like uh, you're doing with the frequentist method. And you can modify that for other priors. And then we're going to close with one different uh, look at margin of error. When you get into um, odds ratios and logistic models, uh, estimating odds ratios can be difficult when you have a rare event or a rare exposure. And um, to estimate an odds ra ratio, um, uh, you're going to have trouble if you can't even estimate the odds. And so this is just a display for what sort of margin of error you can get in estimating odds. And when we're talking about odds or odds ratio, we talk about multiplicative margin of error. And the details are all given here, but the bottom line is um, if you're estimating a probability, uh, we have more trouble estimating when it's in the middle. Uh, but when you're estimating odds, you have more trouble estimating odds when you're in the extremes.
So you can see that if your unknown probability of success is very low or very high, your multiplicative margin of error for estimating the odds uh, if uh, you have a, a situation of extreme probability and let's say what our sample size was here uh, this is when um, the sample size is 384 so th even with a sample size of 384 if your uh, unknown probability is rare or very very common you can easily have a multiplicative margin of error that's worse than two um, and so this is just looking at more relative sort of estimation error than the absolute risk scale. Um, so thank you for listening. Look forward to your comments. And uh, as always, use datamethods.org to add uh, offline questions or comments or discussion. And thanks for participating.